It's time for Tycoons of Small Biz, spotlighting the true backbone of the American economy, the true tycoons of business in America, the owners, founders, and CEOs of small businesses. The show's hosts, Austin Peterson and Landon Nance, are registered representatives of Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker-dealer, member SIPC, and registered investment advisor. The views expressed by your hosts, Austin and Landon, are not necessarily the views of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Backbone Planning Partners is a marketing name for registered representatives of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Now let's lean in as Austin and Landon connect with this week's Tycoons. Good afternoon, Tycoons, and welcome to today's episode of Tycoons of Small Biz. My name is Austin Peterson. I'm one of the hosts of Tycoons of Small Biz. We've been putting this podcast on for a little over two years now. We started on Cinco de Mayo 2020. And if this is the first time you're listening to our podcast, Tycoons of Small Biz is a podcast that's put together by small business owners for small business owners. And we put together this podcast because we believe that the backbone of the American economy is the small business owner and the businesses that they build. And so we wanted to put together this opportunity for business owners to come on, tell their story, share their advice give them a platform to, to do that. And, uh, and we can all learn together. So we appreciate you listening in. We're excited for today's guest. We've got Anthony Weinkoff, director and co-founder of Embrace Tutoring and Educational Services coming to us out of the big, or the garden state, New Jersey. Anthony, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Austin. I appreciate it. Yeah. And I t- to tell you the truth, I'm actually based right outside of Philadelphia. <laughs> Our headquarters is in, is in Northern New Jersey, but my wife and I proudly reside right in Bucks County, PA. Okay, gotcha. So you're you're actually in PA. I knew that you know mm-hmm. Philadelphia is right there on the border, but yeah. So you, yeah. You, great. Well, yeah, I've, I've spent a fair amount of time in Philadelphia over the years myself, and so I, I know the city fairly well. I enjoy the city. Love spending time there. Great. Yeah, yeah, we love it. We love it. We try to go as often as we can. Not often enough. We're pretty we're pretty busy. So <laughs> as like obviously as as entrepreneurs and as things evolve. So yeah, no, I hear you. So. Anthony, before we jump into the business side of things, we typically have our guests tell a little bit about themselves personally. So tell us about where you grew up. Tell us, you know, did you go to college? What did you study? What was family life like? What's family life like today? Are you married? Do you have kids? You know, just just tell us who Anthony is to start off. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. So I, well, first of all, let me let me quickly say that uh, if it gets a little long-winded, let me know. I sort of took a, a very uh, <laughs> different path in terms of in terms of business. One thing that's funny is that when I was growing up, I actually grew up in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, and my friends and I, I was very fortunate to to be on the same street with a number of other young boys, and we sort of started our entrepreneurship goals early on. We would go around and kind of like collect cans and and rake leaves and do various things uh, and, and kind of like form our own little businesses. So it's no surprise that one day, you know, I would end up leading back to entrepreneurship, but Long story short, I was I was uh, blessed enough to study at uh, high school uh, right here in Bucks County, PA, and then I decided to pursue uh, biomedical engineering at Lynchburg College, which was a really terrific place and gave me the opportunity to grow more. It, honestly, because it was such a small school, it honestly gave me the opportunity to really get my feet wet in a number of things. Uh, probably too wet because I was I was way over involved. Right, I was president of the fraternity. I was right. I was an RA. I was a teacher. I was right, just you name it, and I was a double major and triple minor. So there were a lot of a lot of things, but it gave me it gave me the the opportunity to to think. I had some really uh, phenomenal mentors when I was there. Right, Dr. David Fryer uh, was was uh, phenomenal. Our Herbert Bruce was actually one of our uh, kind of TA instructors for a uh, you know freshman orientation course where I. I actually picked up a lot of various teaching strategies that we even use to to this day in terms of principles for Embrace. But flash forward, I took a teaching job out of college because I was sort of trying to figure out what I wanted to do, right? Between MD, MBA, et cetera, I started, uh, when when I took that teaching job, one thing led to another. I started private tutoring then. (laughs) I won an award when I was teaching up in Northern New Jersey, and that award was being featured as the National Teacher of the Week uh, for Carno Sandio, Carney, uh, Sandio and Associates. And what had happened was that I started uh, tutoring like a number of students in addition to my regular teaching schedule, I started kind of keeping data 
of what was working <laughs> and what wasn't working. And I came into contact with two of my co-founders for today for Embrace. And we ended up forming Embrace Tutoring, right? Really for kind of what the mission, the model, and the, the services are and of kind of how everything involved. So I went from biomedical engineering to education, right? To, uh, to business. I've dabbled in a lot of different uh, industries and things and marketing and such. Uh, and, but, uh, you know, I'm incredibly proud of what we've been able to accomplish and, you know, for, for what we've been able to build today. And we're, we're going proudly, I believe, into our ninth year. Um, and we're looking at our other facilities. We have over 200 educators nationwide, right? We've built a really successful model. So we're, we're really proud of kind of the impact that we've had. No, I think you've got a great story. So I, I have to ask this just because everybody knows that it, it doesn't matter what state you live in. It doesn't matter how much you make as a teacher. It's too little, right? And so <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, the question is, it, were you doing the tutoring, one, because you needed extra income or wanted extra income or that and maybe that, you know, you saw students struggling that needed extra help in addition to that? What was what was the you problem? Know, no, yeah. that actually, that's a really good question. I'm, I, you know, I've, I've presented at different business schools and I've gone different places. No one's really ever asked that question. <laughs> so, and, and to tell you the truth, I think it was kind of a, a, a combination of both. I grew up and I was the first male in my family to go to college and growing up in Bucks County, PA, where I would say we're in the, in the area that I grew up, private tutoring really wasn't a thing, right? Private tutoring certainly wasn't uh, as much understood um, as it as it is now in terms of getting like that academic edge or test prep scores, et cetera. So when when I started teaching and I had I had won that award and students started to approach me about private tutoring, I found it very interesting. And I was like, well, we have, you know, you have your I'm right, dude. Uh, we we have teachers here who are phenomenal and we have a number of other individuals. Why is it that in certain areas, a lot of students are sort of still continuing trying to get that edge, right, of, of getting as, as much as they can. So it was, it, was, it was a combination of, yeah, all right, I'm a young 20-something, right, I can use a few extra dollars in my pocket. But then at the same time, I think in the back of my mind, kind of having the vision, I've always been a little bit like of, a, of an engineer at heart of like, how can I make this better? And, and what, you know, what, what uh, regarding the system could be improved? And I think that when individuals started to reach out to me, I thought to myself, oh, well, there's something missing here, right? There's, there's, there's an opportunity for growth. There's an opportunity to kind of scale this in a way that, and maybe if I learn enough about the industry, perhaps this is where I can, you know, find a calling. Perhaps this is where I can really, you know, explore my entrepreneurial spirit through education. And it's been, it's, it's been a beautiful ride because there's nothing more that, I, I find a lot of value in really empowering youth and empowering others and sort of finding a way to kind of give back. And for us to be able to be a part of so many students' uh, educational journeys, right, whether they're applying to high school, whether they're applying to college, whether they're applying to graduate school, it's um, right. We're, we're really there for such a monumental period of their life that it's kind of taken all, all the things I love most, <laughs> right, of like being able to have an impact on, on the community, being able to continue my love for education, and then at the same time, you know, uh, being creative and finding that business outlet. So it's been, it's been a great combination of you know, like utilizing all those skills and all of those interests. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting for me, a guy that, you know, doesn't have a background in education. My, my wife actually was going to be a teacher until she, uh, my wife has a history degree. She always wanted to be a teacher her whole life. She was sure that's what, you know, I'm going to be, an, I'm going to be a history teacher. I'm going to teach inner city schools in LA or, you know, whatever, right? She does her student teaching and realizes, man, most high school students could care less about history. And she was so, <laughs> she was so passionate about it that it was hard for her. It was a struggle, right? Like it was, you know, what do I need to do to pass? What do I, you know, they, they, they had no desire to be there. And that was tough for her being passionate about that subject. Right. And you're, you're passionate about education in general. Um, so, you know, it's always interesting to see what kind of drives you. No, no, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really good point. I think to tell you the truth, I think, I think in some ways now that I look back at it right now that we're blessed enough where I can like sort of, you know, look back in the rear room mirror and we're not right. We're not worrying about cash flow. We're not worrying about all these other things. And it's sort of you, 
you put things in perspective. And, you know, I think that we, but I personally, I think we built Embrace in a way because when I was a student going through high school, there were resources that I personally would have loved to have, right? I, we didn't, I didn't have college counseling. I didn't have test prep. I personally didn't have private tutors, but I did very well in high school, right? I ended up even getting a medical internship my senior year of high school to explore if I wanted to be a doctor, right? <laughs> to sort of see different things. But that's because, you know, my parents really always instilled in me the, the value of hard work, the value of education. My older sister was, was terrific, right, from, a, from an academic standpoint as well as, you know, life standpoint. So she kind of set the, set the stepping stones of, hey, if you do well academically, you're going to give yourself opportunity. And, yeah. you know, in a lot of ways, she was kind of the first uh, vision, right, of embrace. And my mom and my dad, they, they've always instilled hard work. And if you try hard enough, right, you'll put yourself in a better place. But through academics, I would say my, my older sister was definitely a, a really big catalyst of that. And I think that we modeled Embrace purposely, or I, I know that I did intentionally, where I would have loved to have had this as a resource, right, when I was going through these things. And now we continue to innovate purposely, where, you know, what do our students need? You know, can can we be customer obsessed enough where as things are changing, are we identifying the needs of our families? Are we identifying the needs of the parents, right? In addition to the needs of the students, are we identifying the needs of the tutors? So I think I think a lot of it is really just based out of necessity, right? And what what we would have loved to have when I was when I was a, a student going through high school or college. And now it's become, you know, what do we think is really going to innovate to kind of push things further to uh, to benefit their learning experience overall? Yeah. So that kind of makes me think of a a couple of different things. First, I'm going to, I'll just talk about businesses in in education in general, right? Mm -hmm. And again, I'm not an expert, so you can correct me on anything that I say that's wrong. But my observation is that over the last 10 years, for sure, maybe 15 years, you start to see more and more businesses that are targeted towards education pop up. Right, whether it's private tutoring, whether it's math and science centers, school choice, like I would even say that being able to set up, you know, the charter schools and all those kinds of things really run as a as a business, right? Yeah, yeah. That's what they are. Yeah. Yeah, where people make a lot of money, quite frankly. I just feel like it's you know come to the forefront. And on the flip side to that, you've got college pricing, tuitions, everything's going just through the roof. You got everybody who, everybody who feels like the only way to success in life is to go to college. And so, you know, I I guess, how do you balance that? And and if you don't, you know, for your company, because you're just focused on those kids that are headed to college and should be there, that's Mm -hmm. fine. But any thoughts on kind of what the future holds for those kids that going to college isn't the right path for them and helping them to understand that there's a really great path forward, whether it's in the military or in the trades or both or, you know, whatever it, that yeah. may be, you can still have tutoring and internships or uh, programs inside of the high school to prepare you for those paths as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that, that's an amazing question. And to, to be really fair and to sort of give you a, a sneak peek, our bread and butter at Embrace is private tutor, right? We, we, we create customized academic roadmaps working with families from around the country. We work with, we've worked with thousands of families over the year. Currently, we have several hundred even within our network. We do uh, uh, simplified packages where depending on the amount of hours that a, a family will purchase, they will then receive a number of additional features, right? We are aware and we are, we are very aware that not everyone can necessarily afford that type of service, right? We are, we are a very uh, particular service to a very uh, particular type of clientele. And over the years, we've been incredibly, I would actually say one of the biggest moments that, that uh, and it happened this past year was, or, or a few years ago, when we were getting ready to launch our external programs, which is the programs that take place in schools, right? The programs that go directly into schools, not, not private tutoring, but hey, we will help you launch a program. We'll help you launch maybe uh, statewide tests, review, right, SAT, ACT prep, college and career readiness is actually what we refer to it as because it's not just college. There are other components. Um, yeah. One of the places that we had a chance to give back was actually my alma mater, <laughs> right? I went back to high school. 
they didn't have uh, a test prep class, I said, this is got to change, right? So we stepped in, we offered that class. The kids did incredibly well. They're even graduating today. They're in the workforce. They're right. They're, they're living their dream. And that kind of rippled. And we were just by being kind and giving back and sort of identifying a need for others, we were able to then kind of perpetuate that into what we now have. I would say, I would say we have, we have almost 12 to 15 different programs. We've worked with Red Bull in the past. We work with a number of nonprofits uh, specifically who that audience may not be able to afford private tutoring, but more specifically, they, you know, they, they were able to kind of subsidize and, and work with them from a class standpoint. Now, the reason I, I mentioned that at all is that we actually work with what's called the Bucks County Technical High School and that, and as well as some other vocational programs. And we're very aware that college may not, college per se may not be for every student, but it's always about higher education. It's not necessarily about, about college. Even my, my stepfather, I, I really wouldn't be where I am today without him. He was a veteran, right, in, in the United States military, proudly so. And we do our best to kind of honor those programs. And we, we inform parents as well as our audience, you know, what their options are. It may not be college, but they may need some element of like prerequisites because that might help them with a certification. It might help them with some sort of, you know, you know, additional degree in the future. We even have students that go for culinary arts, right? <laughs> but they're taking they're taking some of our classes for you know bookkeeping, for running a restaurant, or individual. So we we refer to it as college and career readiness. And so I'll tell you the truth, those are those are some some of my favorite programs and services that we offer because you you really get to kind of see so much of a difference. They're not trying to all go Ivy League, so to speak, right? They're they get a lot of value out of it because they're at the same time, they're kind of testing and discovering what they really want to do. So it's, it, it is, it is kind of a beautiful thing. Yeah. I think, I think it's important, you know, I mean, I, I've got, I did well academically. I've, I've got a bachelor's degree. I mean, you can see on the screen there, I've got an MBA. So I, I believe wholeheartedly in education, but the reality is I came from a family of parents that had GEDs. Mm -hmm. Right. So it, it was not something that was taught in the home. It wasn't something that was really even understood in the home. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, fast forward to having my own family, my own kids. I've got a 22 year old son that's a year away from graduating from college. Mm -hmm. He'll have a bachelor's degree in, in uh, sports journalism. And then my second child who went to college for a year and she, both of them did great academically throughout high school, both over 4.0 weighted GPA, you know, good, good students, right? But my daughter didn't know or didn't realize, and we talked to her about some things and we didn't know for sure ourselves, but the traditional college programs for her, it, it's not going to be right. Even though she was a good student, mm -hmm. it's not going to be right for her. And then add on top of that, that certain things happen, right? My daughter had a concussion has kind of a history of concussions mm -hmm. and that really threw her off and being able to learn. So there has to be other things in place because it's just, everybody's not on the same path or should be. Yeah, no, you're, you're really, you're exactly right there. And the, although we do work with a lot of students that are very specific to what I would like to go to these list of schools, X, Y, and Z, this is sort of the path that I envision, which is the I would say the common, right? That's the common idea of I'm going to high school, then I'm going to college, then I'm going to grad school, right? That's sort of the, the 10 year plan. And for some specialties, to be fair, if you want to be a surgeon, that's exactly what you need to do, right? And for some specialties, and, and the, but the irony is that, say for instance, entrepreneurship, right? I'm a much better person where I learn on my feet. YouTube wasn't even around when I was in high school. Oh my God, I don't even know what I would have been able to, <laughs> right? like, to do. And it's... um. But I've, I've always been, I've read a lot consistently, right, as an adult, as well as a child. I was constantly investigating things. I will still watch documentaries, like, nonstop, because I just, I just sort of love to learn. And I think yep. that outside of general schooling, and we tell students this all the time, that do not let the walls define your, you know, your realm of education, right? You're going to need to learn things outside of the classroom. And that's one thing I didn't realize early on, that I've come to discover either either at, at college or come discover at conferences I've attended. I, 
I've even worked out at Stanford University as a, as a faculty liaison and research liaison. You come to really discover that, you know, don't, don't let your surroundings hold you back. There are resources out there if you wish to kind of pursue those endeavors. You don't necessarily need the traditional schooling outlet, but you do need to understand that you were literally embracing education and you kind of need to put yourself in that, you know, that opportunity for growth. And if you, you, it's, it's more of a mindset, really, more than anything else. And it doesn't matter what path you choose, you're going to learn to need to right, adapt and, and grow and, and just sort of be a lifelong learner, right, and continuous learner. Yep. And it, and it doesn't matter whether it's education that you're learning, you know, going through traditional education or you're learning skills or apprenticeship programs or, you know, whatever in the trades, you know, there, there's this belief. And we had a guy on the, on the program, father and son on the program a few weeks ago, and they were actually our very first podcast guests over two years ago. Oh, but, yeah. I had a chance to listen to that, actually. Did you listen yeah, to that yeah. one? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I think that there's this belief among certain parts of our population that believe that if you go into the trades, it's because you're dumb. Right. And, and that's just not the case. There are so many smart people that are in the trades and so much math and science that goes mm-hmm. into what they do. Mm-hmm. It's just it's what you want to do. And you shouldn't feel like you can't do something that you're passionate about because people believe that you should go the traditional route. No, no, I, I firmly believe in building skills, right, building skills, and whether it's math or problem solving or writing. Right. You want to you want to build those skills in any any way that you intend to kind of collect those skills. And, and to tell you the truth, my, a lot of, a lot of my uh, immediate family are actually in the trades, right? My father-in-law is in the trades. He went to Williams college, which is a sort of a, a really recognized nationally uh, a trade school. I grew up around trades and I, I too was kind of, you know, I'm not going to pick up that hammer, which is hilarious now because my, my wife and I are also kind of real estate investors and she is a real estate agent in Bucks County. And I can tell you, uh, understanding trades and understanding what you're looking for, and you know, even putting your your shower door up or how to hang things, right? It goes goes a very long way. So you might as well sort of take take that skill up and say, you know, there's value in this. And and even at, even honestly, really at a young age of not not diminishing certain skills and and kind of really um, again like embracing them and saying, okay, there's everyone has value. How can perhaps I learn from this and, and, and how can I sort of move forward? Because you never know when maybe you're going to need the plumber, right? <laughs> you never know when you might need that individual or that tradesman. And there's, and many of them, they love what they do. And right. There's a good living in that. We work with a number of students that really enjoy that. And then we also work with a number of students who work for Google now, or they're astro uh, scientists, right? But there's, there's uh, different students have different paths. And, and that's the important thing to acknowledge. Yep, no, no doubt about it. Well, in just a second, we're going to take a break and, and hear a call to action. But before we do that, I want to just kind of end this segment with asking you, what do you believe is the most important lesson or lessons that you've learned throughout your career thus far? God, okay. <laughs> uh, the most important lessons I've learned. I will tell you this, that my one life switch that I feel like as though I've had is that in it, I was, I was incredibly analytical. I was, I, I've always had the ability to learn fairly quickly, pick things up, problem solve, right? Very math, science related. I was also fairly good at writing literature, et cetera. But the one life skill I feel like that just is not taught enough is, is like emotional intelligence or the ability to have empathy with others. And my wife has been phenomenal and kind of instilling some of those uh, qualities in me. But then also I had a chance to read a book, How to Win Friends and Influence People years ago and yeah. really changed my perspective of not just how to treat others, but finding the value of treating others. I've always, I've always been one for citizenship. I've always been one for giving back, but, but doing it genuinely speaking and, and finding the joy in it, I feel like is has been the, the life altering moment that I've had in the last probably 20 or like 15, 20 years or so. So I feel like the, the life skill that, that many and even entrepreneurs really should, should come to learn and read the book, right? Read, read how to win friends and influence people's empathy. I think empathy is, is one of the greatest skills and, and very, very underrated, very underrated within, they, they should have an empathy class in high school to tell you the truth. 
Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. It, it's funny you mentioned that because I'm part of the planning committee for a national conference that's coming up in September. And the overarching theme is, is EQ or emotional yeah. intelligence. Right? And this is an industry industry uh, conference for financial planners throughout the country, right? And so you'd think that it's all about numbers and mm-hmm. how do you how do you deal with taxes here? Or how do you, you know, whatever the, the logistics of how our businesses operate. But the reality is what really matters to people is not the dollars and cents, right? They, they want, of course, that's the vehicle, but they want what they care about is their family and or their business or their community or, you know, whatever. And if you're not spending time talking to them about that, you're missing the mark as, as a financial planner. And same thing with you, right? If you're not talking them to them with empathy or speaking to them about what matters most and you just decide that you've got to talk to them about their science scores or their test prep scores or whatever, mm-hmm. you're, you're going to miss the mark. Yeah, I, I, I feel like it just in general makes us, it makes us better human beings, but then also at the same time, I know, I know for me personally, it has made me a much better business person because it gives us the idea, the ability to listen to what our audience's needs, even before sometimes they need it, right? Sometimes before they come to us. And like, for instance, we're, we're adding now within Embrace, we do, we do various packages and features and different amenities. And we're, we're considering adding a health and wellness, right? And into our, into our packages, in addition to our college counseling and our financial planning and all the other things, because we think that many of our students may be anxious and it would be benefit them to have you know, an, an individual they can turn to for therapeutic services. And I think that just understanding your market or your industry and listening requires a high degree of empathy. No doubt about it. All right, well, let's take a quick break. Let's hear a quick call to action for our listeners, and then we'll, we'll come back and dig in a little more. Hey there, tycoons. Austin Peterson here, co-host of Tycoons of Small Biz. If you think you have what it takes to be considered a tycoon and you're wondering how you could become a featured guest, please follow and then message us at Tycoons of Small Biz on LinkedIn. We'd love to have a conversation with you to see if it is a mutually good fit. And if so, we'll get you scheduled for an interview. If you're unsure about being a guest on our podcast, but are contemplating selling your business over the next few years and you'd like to know what your business is worth, Please also follow us and then message us on LinkedIn for your no obligation, informal valuation of your business. We look forward to hearing from you and thanks for listening to the Tycoons of Small Biz podcast. And now back to today's program. Welcome back Tycoons. We're here with Anthony Wyckoff with Embrace Tutoring coming to us from outside of Philadelphia. And uh, we've talked about, you know, quite a bit uh, from the education system in our country and kind of where the directions go. The most important lesson for you, obviously, being being empathy. But let's let's think about those people who may be listening or even people that you're, you know, your company is tutoring that have a desire to be an entrepreneur, or at least think they they want to do that in the future. So what advice do you have for young entrepreneurs or young aspiring entrepreneurs who are thinking about taking that plunge that, that you and I have taken? It's a good question. I, Ooh, let's say, let's say, I feel like there's so many things there's, we've, we've pivoted a lot along the way. We've learned what advice my, my immediate advice is a lot. I feel as though a lot of individuals and I, and and also, and and you're more than welcome to, to speak to this too. I feel like entrepreneurship over the last few years has become very hot. Right, it's become very trendy, and and a lot of individuals are sort of thinking, "Oh, I want that that four hour work week life," and, <laughs> and then sort of the the idea of I can work from anywhere. But I would I would say before you realistically take the plunge, there's there's probably a, a few things you need to do. The first is you need to go and get your feet wet in the field. Right? Don't don't think that you're going to open up that particular type of business or that industry. Um, and not having done enough of the research yourself, or not have, have, have actually having worked in that uh, in that field, I was I was fortunate. I was already in education for years. I was a sophomore and a junior class dean in two different schools, right? And one was even a nationally ranked private school. I had been uh, tutoring by the time that we started our business, uh, you know, dozens and dozens of students. So I had enough kind of anecdotal information. I've had connections and contacts and so I, and I, and a lot of things I, and initially when you're, when you first jump into a business, you're not, you're not thinking all those things matter. Right. But then when you put it all together holistically, you're like, oh, I'm, 
I'm ready. Right? And I have I have a network around me. I have a support system. I've learned enough to to take this plunge. I had a business degree at the same time, so I knew enough about kind of the literature and what to read. But I would say anyone looking to this really needs to go and get the experience that they need. Right? They need to go work in that field, get their feet wet. Right? Uh, surround themselves with with really great mentors and leaders. Don't be afraid to ask questions. And then and then at the same time, learn to find. So, so, so the time is also a big, a big question. Like, when do you actually jump in? And I would say, when you feel as though <laughs> it's going to bring value to, to, uh, you know, people's lives, regardless if you're the one that starts the business, that's, that's the time when you jump in. If you, if you feel as though I can't think about anything else and I have to do this and I, I have to kind of move forward. And it's sort of eating you of like, I feel as though I can, I can make this happen and I have some sort of calling to it then. And assuming your financials are in order, right? Assuming you have enough of a nest egg to kind of move forward and give yourself some runway, that is your time. And, uh, and you kind of, you kind of take a chance on yourself. And I always tell myself and, and as well as our students, um, and when I do like commencement speeches and such, I always tell them to chase purpose, right? Don't, don't go after it immediately for the dollars because, there will be days where it will be tough, right? <laughs> yeah, chase, chase purpose, chase bringing value to others, and everything will everything will fall in line. Everything will work out. And find really good business partners. Right? Like I was, I was fortunate enough to take on two really good business partners who are very different at heart, but also at the same time as a unit, we work very well together. Um, so find really good business partners, get the experience that you need, and understand the timing. Of really when you want to jump in. Those are probably the three immediate things I would, I would categorize. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's a good list. I think that, you know, the, the mention of purpose over money is, is a big one. Mm. Um, you know, I, and then cash flow. I mean, you mentioned cash flow. I, I can't say enough to people, whether it's the listeners of this program or anybody else that I meet, most often it's not a business does not fail because they don't have a good idea or they're not, they don't have enough customers or they're not doing enough marketing. It fails because of cash flow, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if you're a hundred thousand dollar a year revenue business to start, or you're a hundred million dollar a year revenue business. Cash flow is still king. And if you take your eye off of that ball, you can fail even at a hundred million dollar a year business. Yeah. And so you, we thought about that actually, and that's exactly why we never took on any investors initially, because we wanted to be incredibly diligent and aware of how we were spending our money when we were doing kind of our proof of concept and testing the market. We didn't want to just take on investors to to kind of we we intentionally even to this day we bootstrapped the entire company. We've been cash flow positive since day one. We've had twenty to thirty percent growth year over year, even through COVID. You know, knock off. I wish I had I'm gonna knock off something right. But but yeah, you're right. Cash flow is king, and I think a lot of other a lot of people under underestimate that. So you kind of have to pick and choose the spots of, you know, do I have a side job, you know, as this is happening, and and sort of work on it nights and weekends. When do you dive in? Right? Do you have the right support? Are you ready? And and perhaps even speaking to to individuals like yourself and Landon could could go a long way for certain people, right? In terms of that. Uh, that financial planning aspect of like, is this the right time for me to, uh, right. To, to start a business. Yeah. I mean, I think regardless, you just have to go in with your, with your eyes wide open. You have to take those rose colored glasses off. And, you know, just because you knew people that own their own business and they had every toy imaginable, they got the boat and the second home and the beach house and, you know, all these kinds of things. And, and all you think is, man, they've got a great life. They never work. They've got all kinds of money. They've got every toy. That is not the reality. No. You know, most, yeah, most entrepreneurs work way more than somebody who has a normal job working for somebody else. No. Most entrepreneurs become an overnight success after 10 years or more, right? And, and just really grinding that business. And then the last thing that I would, that I would kind of reiterate that you said, and I want, I think it bears repeating, especially I, maybe you said earlier, I, I wasn't quite sure if you said, did you say you're 32 years old? 35. Okay. So you know, you're, you're about 10 years younger than me, but a lot of entrepreneurs today, your age and younger believe that you take on an investment from, from the get-go, right? Mm -hmm. You're out there looking for angel investment or private equity or whatever the case may be. 
And I think the art understanding of bootstrapping a business is kind of going by the wayside because of the market that we're in today and have been in for the last decade. And, mm-hmm. and I just don't know that it's a positive thing. I can't agree with you enough. <laughs> there are so many, and even now we get, we get solicited for investors probably daily every time we sign on to, to LinkedIn and, and granted, and we're, we're certainly open to those conversations, but I think for us, and to, to tell you the truth, I remember one time I was presenting, it was either, it was at Ryder or Princeton for their entrepreneur group. They, and, and I remember one student asked me, you know, what is it? And this was, this was my, our second, third year of business. And I was a deer in the headlights, right? We were grinding every day. We're trying to figure things out. We're testing the market. We're adapting. I'm literally home, just plugging away, right? Constantly. I remember one of the students asked, you know, what is it really like? Like, what is it, what is it really like to start a business? And I, and I think I told them that, you know, fortunately enough, I, I have that engineering kind of mindset where you, you kind of like jump out of a plane and you're building a parachute on the way down and no one really sees you until you land. Right. And then, and then everyone thinks you're like that overnight success and, and here you are, but they don't, they don't see the hours you've put in. They don't see the, a lot of the, the, the friends and the family, right. The support of all of the little things, right. One of my, one of my best friends who is now going into her third child, she was there uh, with my wife and I, when my wife was just my girlfriend at the time, literally folding mail flyers to send out to our, one of our first ever mail drops at my, and my previous apartment. And some people who are going to be with you literally through the grind, you, you kind of remember those things and they know, and they kind of understand the work that you've put in, but from afar to, to the, to, I would say to the normal person, they just sort of like, wow, you landed, you're on, you're on tycoons of small biz, right? <laughs> and then you're like, here, here you are. And they don't, they don't see a lot of kind of the, the, you know, the, the journey that really goes into it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because most of the big the big entrepreneurs nationwide, they know that they've arrived when they've been invited to be on Tycoons of Small Biz. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think that, that that's right on. I mean, that you mentioned it, and I'm just going to kind of drill that home a little bit more. And that's that any relationship that you have that's close to you, whether it's a romantic relationship or parents or whoever it is that's that's really close to you at the time, you've got to make sure that they're on board with what it is that you're doing, especially if they're affected in any way in terms of your relationship or financially or both. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And matter of fact, what was odd is that one of my best friends actually became my business partner. And then we then ended up taking on an, another business partner because she shared a, a similar vision. We thought that this could, this could work well. And there was a lot of consideration when right friends were becoming business partners and sort of how that would go. And, but, but you're absolutely right. You, yeah, we wouldn't be where we were today if we didn't have the support and the, the love really from, from either our in-laws, our significant others, right. Even, even our, our one, uh, my one business partner, Suzanne, her husband will come and he will help paint <laughs> sometimes if we need to do things in the, in the, you know, in the facility. And he's, you know, he's terrific. And we all kind of become a family, right? It's a culture. you you realize you're kind of marrying into these, these people because it's, it's, it, it is. And if, and as the business grows and it becomes more and more successful, the relationships will become more enduring and, and you want that, right? You want to build that type of culture. And some of the tutors that we have on staff, we've had since day one, Right. Some of the tutors we've even had, we were going into our eighth or ninth year working with those same tutors and having those relationships are, are sometimes the best part of the job, right? <laughs> of, of having yeah. those individuals. Yeah. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. All right. So I'm gonna kind of wrap two questions in in one for you because they might they might kind of come together, but um, you know, <laughs> you can ask whatever you want. Yeah. Overall, right, in, in your life, specifically in business at this point, who would you say has been your, your greatest influence or influences? And then because it might tie in, I'm going to ask it, you know, now, and then if it doesn't, you can just answer them separately. But in, in terms that you mentioned earlier, mentors and the importance of having mentors, and a mentor doesn't necessarily have to be somebody that you personally know And that you're spending time with and some, you know, it can also be, you mentioned, you know, Tony Robbins book or there, you know, there's other entrepreneurs that are very active on social media 
or that we have access to today via YouTube that we didn't have access to 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So who's your greatest influence? And then as in terms of other entrepreneurs, who is it you're following and trying to, to mimic, I guess, or learn from? So I'll go, I'll go with the influences question first, but they, it kind of, they kind of couple into mentorship, right? I've, when I was, when I was growing up, I think that my, my mom, my dad, even though they didn't actually graduate from high school, they were very much instilled in me, the, the quality of education and how that can make such a difference in your life. And for then me to go on and study at various institutions and now own an educational service company that gives back and we work with you know, thousands of students is, is kind of heartwarming. I would say my, my sister was a huge uh, influence in my life in terms of kind of paving that way uh, for, for, you know, how, how education could, could give you and open up doors and give you opportunities. Um, so I would, I I love her and I appreciate, appreciate her every day for that. (laughs) And then from a, you know, a current mentor, uh, I, you know, I, I do have some personal family members and some, and some friends that I, that I lean upon if I have questions, uh, related to business. I personally would probably love to find someone who, like an actual like business mentor, someone who could who could sort of coach a little bit more because because I've I've been blessed to have uh, mentors who don't really even know their mentors, right? I I read a lot of uh, Simon Sinek, right? Who is uh, right? Who is a phenomenal uh, emotional intelligence individual and business speaker. I'm literally reading his uh, his his book right now, which is which is Start with Why, right? Which yeah. I think which I think is a terrific read for anyone. I really love his his delivery, his tactful nature, and the, the, what he does. When I was um, when we decided to take the plunge, and I had to kind of go through that learning curve of business and what does it mean to be an entrepreneur, I watched a ton of of uh, business videos. Um, so like Harvard iLab was was phenomenal. Um, the Profit right with Marcus Lemonis, um, and then I started following various individuals. Sarah Blakely, who is the woman who develops uh, Spanx and runs that company, she's actually been a huge kind of like how she treats others and the culture that she builds and the inventive and creativeness that she has. I don't really think she gets a lot of credit for. And I kind of, so personal mentors that I follow, um, those, those are just the, to name a few, but, but lifelong influences that I had definitely my parents, my sister, some mentors I've had in college, uh, Herbert Bruce, who I mentioned earlier, uh, Dr. Bill Lokar, who was, who was a phenomenal teacher that I had in college, and uh, David Fryer, who was, who was my actual academic advisor when I, when I went to Lynchburg. And then I've had, I've had you know, I've, I've, come into, I've come into contact with so many individuals, and I've been, I've been blessed, right, in that, in that sense, where, you know, grandparents have, have, you know, I was raised, you know, in a home where my grandparents were there. And that is so valuable. Like I really, I really lucked out to have my grandparents there to be able to spend time with them. So I've had a lot of mentors like along the way in some facet or another that have taught me, you know, various skills. And I've just tried to, I've just tried to pick the good ones right? and, uh, and, and go with it. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more on the parents and grandparents thing. I mean, my, my parents were both are, are still both very important in my life. And when I say parents, I was actually raised by my stepfather. My parents were divorced when I was very young. My dad, my biological father gave up his parental rights and I was adopted by my, my mom's new husband and, and raised by him. The influence that they've been on me my entire life can't, can't be measured. And grandparents, I think, is, is, a, is an underestimated group of people, right? I, I think that we're seeing that dissipate in our culture because... If you go back 50 years, people got married a lot younger than they do today. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. 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 So kids aren't spending as much time with their grandparents today that they used to. Oh, you know, I was I was lucky. I had great grandparents that were alive and in my life until I was 20 years old. Yeah. And, and that, so, is, that is like few and far between these days, right? You said, as yeah. you mentioned, culturally, that's just not a... That's, that's uh, one of the reasons why my wife and I actually moved back to Bucks County, to tell you the truth. We, had, we were living up in northern New Jersey when I first started Embrace was because yeah. our grandparents were both, our, sadly, the, 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 the significant others of our grandparents had passed. So we both moved home to be closer. 
and those were some of the best memories that we have had, right? Just to have the have that time and spend with him because it was funny that I, you know, we were best friends when we were kids, and then later on in life, I ended up becoming, you know, my pops, my pops' best friend, right? Towards the towards the latter days of, you know, when he was around, I wouldn't change those memories for anything, and it's just it kind of helped me get to where I am today, and we were really blessed to be able to, you know, come back and, and spend time with him while we could, and, and personally and professionally, it's all worked out, right? It all we put ourselves in a good opportunity and we gave ourselves the chance to, yeah, okay, we'll expand, we'll move, we'll expand, we'll explore other endeavors. And we, but we, but it was, it was sort of family first. Yeah. I love that. I think that, I think it's important. You just have to have your priorities straight. You know, it doesn't mean you have to have a specific religion or a specific belief about anything, but what's most important in my life is my family and my faith and then my business. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think all of us should have at least family first, if not something else first, you know, before our business, it helps us put, it helps put us in the right frame of mind and have the right perspective about what it is that we're building and why. Yeah. There, yeah. The why is the, is the key question, right? We've, we, I, we personally do things. My wife, my wife is also an entrepreneur and outside of being a real estate agent, she also owns a children's uh, party company, children's entertainment company in Bucks County, which, she is one year after year for best, <laughs> right? And and it's kind of it's kind of amazing. And my wife is the only person I know that has been to make a wishes, right? For for individuals, she works with Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. But we we do things intentionally because we we love having that impact and you know that joy for others. But family is it's always kind of the you know we we prioritize family as much as we can. To make time to go and see them there's not there's never enough time today to be honest especially when you're running businesses but but yeah we our our why is to help put our family in a better position yeah all right so last question for you and then we've, we've made it to the end anthony so congratulations <laughs> thank you i always find it fascinating to talk about an entrepreneur's typical day right so i i'll kind of lay that out for you like i'm very schedule. I'm process oriented. I have, I have things that I do every single morning and I have to do them in order before I start my business day, right. That are important to me, whether it's exercise or, you know, reading something, whatever it is to kind of get me in the right frame of mind for, for what I'm doing from a business standpoint. So describe a typical day for us, for, for Anthony. (laughs) Uh, Well, let's see. I'm, I'm, I'm really big into lists really big into well actually let me let me preface with this every time and we've sort of learned this early on that we do things intentionally to scale those things that's how we operate our business in terms of systems so if we're doing something we're doing it intentionally so that but then next time we do it it's a little bit more simplified right every single time so yes. when we do things for the first time it may take a little bit longer but that's intentionally so we can set up the dominoes kind of for the future. And that I do that exact same process with my day, right? So, so let's say that I, I have like email templates that I have a bunch of other things. I'll wake up. The first thing I do is actually make my bed, <laughs> which sometimes annoys my wife if she's still like on the other side because it's so early. And I'll make my side of the bed, right? And then uh, we try as much as possible, depending on the heat. Um, I know you guys are in Arizona, so I'm not going to complain, but we try as much as possible to just take some us time in the morning. We'll make breakfast, uh, usually around like seven or eight. We'll walk our dog, right? That's right before we get to emails, et cetera. We always take a little bit of time for emails, sort of catching up on things, answering whatever it is that we need to. And then comes kind of the creative time, usually from 10 to anywhere from 1 p.m. Those are the big decision times of the day. Right. If we're going to make big decisions, for instance, I was in tech meetings all this morning uh, because because that requires the most thought focus of what's happening. And then throughout the day, there might be uh, various meetings, checking with tutors, going to various programs. If we're if we're training the tutors, checking on the facility, for instance, I, I will say this over the years, our day has gotten much easier and easier because we have a really good team. We've entrusted people to do what they do and do what they do well. So our my day has has absolutely it evolves, you know, year to year. Where 
it seems as though I'm doing a little bit less, but at the same time, it's more about management and leadership rather than me sort of myself doing the X's and the O's. So now at the end of the day, I get to do more of the creative side, kind of big picture. What, what are, what am I setting up for tomorrow? You know, what are things that we need to prepare for? Even this, right. I had already, we had already sent the the questions along, right. We'd already discussed certain things. I'd already talked with my wife. <laughs> Sorry, I've already done other, uh, other discussions and that for us to be able to hop on, right. Kind of even, you know, with, with, at a, at a moment's notice, we just try to prepare for success. Right. And that's, and that's sort of the way that I, that I handle things now. now I'm not going to lie. Like we don't have, we don't enjoy ourselves. I spend time with friends and family. We will definitely have the moments where we'll turn the phones off and we will, we will cook dinner and we will right enjoy it. But, but from a, from a day to day, it's usually from anywhere, right. It's, it's the, uh, it's the, the family time in the morning, really important conversations and, and business meetings in the afternoon general meetings and such and checking in on people sort of mid-afternoon and then at night is sort of when I let the creative right the creative in me fly that's when I'll take notes that's when I'll uh that's when I'll do research and that's when I'll check in just in general for like tutor logs progress reports etc and that's that uh, that I would say is a typical day (laughs) right yeah for how things go yeah, no, I think I think that's great. I mean, you, you took care of the family, you took care of your own, you know, your own personal growth. I think that those are really important for our own health and wellness. I mean, everybody needs that. If you if you haven't read it, I would suggest that you you read a book called Driven. It's the Larry H. Miller story. So he used to own the Utah Jazz, but he owns a bunch of car owned a bunch of car dealerships, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, kind of just built this big this big empire, but he did it at the detriment of his own health. And so he passed away way too early from complications of diabetes that could have been avoided if he'd just taken better care of himself along the way. I think it's just really important. There's there's a big issue with entrepreneurs in our country to where we spend our entire lives built amassing this fortune and then and let our health slide and then we spend the later years of our life trying to spend all of our money to get our health back and it's just it's something that needs to be addressed and taken care of you have to take time for yourself and your personal relationships and let business be second and sometimes it's okay to say no and really i would say understand the the worth of what we've we've worked with programs for instance where we wanted to to meet um you know as as we're like working out the roles and the responsibilities of what we'll do. And then we just realized it's just too much to, to take on for kind of the, the cost benefit analysis. And we said, well, this is going to be too much for the tutor. It's going to be too much for, and so, so it's, a, it's okay to, to say no. We know, and we're, we're blessed. We're in a position where we don't need to take everything on, where we're going to overwhelm ourselves. And more importantly, where it's going to compromise the business, compromise the health of the tutor, compromise, you know, all of our other audience. So we've, we've, it's, it's, a, it's okay to take care of our people first and, and kind of, kind of focus on that. So I, I 100% agree with you. Yeah. Well, listen, I really appreciated the conversation, Anthony. Appreciate your willingness to come on. Um, for our listeners, he came on last minute. We had a, an internet issue with today's guest. And so he came on a week early. And we really appreciate you being willing to, to be flexible there. Just tell our listeners how to track you down. If you're if you're in need of tutoring services, test prep, all those sorts of things, how do they track you down? Yeah, thanks, Wells. So the, the best way to, to reach us is through embracetutoring.com, which is www.embracetutoring.com. Our LinkedIn, our social media pages, we actually have an entire video series for SAT, ACT prep, as well as a number of others that we've kind of given back and launched in our uh, YouTube platform. So you're welcome to look up Embrace Tutoring TV. If you'd like to con- connect with me personally, LinkedIn is, is by far the best. You're, feel, feel free to simply send me a message. We'd love to collaborate. We're always looking for various uh, affiliations and, and partnerships. And if you're looking for either to continue the conversation for private tutoring, test prep, AP, college counseling, et cetera, we'd, we'd love to feel free to give us a call and, and we'd be happy to kind of continue. If you'd like to get with, in t- get, am I allowed to give my number? Is that? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. If, if, um, if you want to get in contact with me personally, it's 908-255-5647.
So you're welcome to, to contact me personally. But again, LinkedIn is generally what I'll be checking most often. And you're you're more than welcome to to kindly reach out and be happy to to you know connect and and do a do a Zoom coffee, right? Do a virtual coffee and just kind of catch up, get to know each other a little bit better. Awesome. Again, really appreciate it, Anthony. The, the conversation was fantastic and and really appreciate your flexibility. Yeah, I appreciate you guys having me. I know that uh, we were anticipating next week and I was I uh, fortunately you caught me on the the day after long work, which is why I look very tan right now. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Yeah. So, but at the, at the same, at the same time, this has been a pleasure. I've, and I, and I have to say again, to, you know, kudos to you guys. I know I mentioned a lot of like YouTube and, and Harvard iLab, but um, when we were talking, pre, uh, you know, earlier during some of the preliminary conversations, I really think this, this, this podcast has a lot of value. And I know that if I was just starting out in terms of an entrepreneurship, I would have absolutely kind of digest, digested, you know, episode after episode. So. I seriously commend you guys for what you're doing and putting the spotlight on a lot of upcoming, you know, businesses from around the country. I've personally, I've personally gone on many a jog and listened to a number of episodes. You're, you really have something special. So I definitely, I definitely commend you for that. And thank you again for having me on. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, very kind of you. Thank you so much. You've been listening to Tycoons of Small Biz proudly hosted by Austin Peterson and Landon Mance. Austin and Landon are comprehensive financial planning professionals specializing in financial, estate, and succession planning for small business owners. Austin and Landon have offices in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada, and represent clients in 14 states throughout the country. Join Austin, Landon, and the Featured Tycoons live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. right here on Business Radio X and your favorite 